Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Capital Gains Show. My name is Aaron, and today I'm lucky to have my good friend Ryan join me for a debate or a discussion about anarchy, statelessness, and specifically property rights. Um, we want to talk about what kind of property modes will we expect to exist in a stateless society and what kind of property rights are morally justified or which ones work the best for people and, and that kind of thing. So um, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll get right into it. But f first, Ryan, would you like to give me, you know, a quick brief um, idea or give the listeners, you know, a brief idea about um, how you became an anarchist, what, what direction you lean and what you think about property rights like public versus private in a stateless society. Okay. Uh, let's see. It was definitely a progression. I, you know, grew up in establishmentarianism, sort of, uh, I was in love with the American dream, the founding fathers, that whole thing. Like, it was just what I thought. And <clears throat> I would say probably starting around 9-11, I was like, whoa, okay, maybe this shit's kind of fucked up. Uh, dot com, the dot-com bubble burst, and my dad and I were building web pages, so it just kind of set me off onto a, I guess, non-establishment thought. And then, um, I don't know, politically I began to diverge more towards the extremes with Ron Paul than Bernie Sanders, and then... I took those ideas and those policies and applied them and realized, like, there's more going on here and that we just need to take care of people as opposed to get caught up in the politics and stuff like that. And then, coupled with my religious or, you know, scriptural studies, um, mm -hmm. I became very – well, I've always been very serious about it, but consistently. So the whole picture, you know, not just my little worldview, but I applied it to the entire universe. And as I observed – and I observed nature, and I observed how things work, I came to the conclusion that the only law I believe in is there is no law. And so I began to practice this idea that, like, I'm not obligated to do anything other than, say, what my nature is. Like, I have to breathe and stuff like that, but I don't have to agree to anything. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to say anything. I don't have to react to anything. It's all a matter of choice. And so... I began to understand anarchy. You know, I would debate on Facebook, and I would learn and be exposed to these ideas and those ideas. And um, I started to, I guess, form my own opinions. And I, I guess I try not to lean too left, though I do tend to be more communist, only because they seem to be more compassionate as opposed to mm -hmm. you know, fend for yourself, like the caps. Mm -hmm. However, I, I'm definitely like libertarian, like, don't you dare trade on me, but it's equal. You know, I won't trade on you either. So uh, that's my perspective on, as you know, synopsis. Uh, pri private property, I tend to look at it in terms of levels, and it's really all about what you want to agree to. Base level, no such thing as ownership, no such thing as natural rights that I'm obligated to recognize what you recognize. Like, you can think of you have property, but that doesn't mean it's right or true or, you know, something that applies to anyone other than yourself and those who agree with it. And anarchy starts out at zero for me. It's nature. It's the animals. Like, they have territory, but they don't have property. You know, that an animal will see, okay, there is a line there and a law, you know, like a property deed that says that's yours and not mine. It's like, mm -hmm. if I can take it, take it. Like, there's nothing stopping me except you. And so I apply that to humans yeah. as well. But we're inherently animals, and we live according to that natural tendency, and yet our difference is we can choose. So mature anarchy, to me as I call it, would be we respect one another by choice, not because we have to. Hmm. I like that. Yeah, and uh, regarding, regarding property, do you feel, I get what you're saying about the whole... Um, the, the, you know, it depends on what people agree on or what they recognize, and they're not obligated to recognize, you know, someone else's property claim. Do you feel like mm -hmm. that kind of objection or that kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, analysis of property rights applies equally to 
publicly owned or communally owned property as it does to private property? Or do you feel like that criticism is something more of a, of a, of a private property only criticism? Because because while I get what you're saying about the idea that 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 no one's obligated to recognize this kind of claim or whatever, uh, just just on the base level, I feel like that would apply equally to all different kinds of property right claims. You know, if a, if a community says on the whole that the, there's a public park, or if someone says, oh, I privately own this park, it feels to me like that criticism that you brought up would apply equally in both cases. I don't know. Yes, I'm consistent with it. Like public property, I know uh, tend to be more of a, um, it's private and public is a state idea. You know, uh, like to me an anarchy with co like ANCOMs, that community that claims to own a territory it's more of a collective of individuals uh, bringing their claims together as opposed to like a city owning it, you know? So they just have their piece and they agree to uh, uh, pool it together for their resources and things like this. And again, it's a choice. And the danger without the state is there's nothing protecting you. Like, you know, there could be another community out there bigger and said, okay, I'm going to come and take your property and they're in anything you can do about it except try and fight them off or maybe join with another community or something like that, you know. So it is really, I mean, it takes a mature person to be a real anarchist and to have it sustainable. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I I agree with that. One of the things that, that, that comes up in my mind a lot when I think about anarchy in, in the in the vein where you're talking about maturity and, and, and being an adult about it is when, when you don't have a babysitter or a nanny state, you know, hovering over you. I, th I feel like the, uh, you know, that phrase, let the buyer beware. I feel like that comes into play a lot because there has to be a lot of self-responsibility. You're, 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 you're more responsible for yourself and, 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 and the well-being of yourself is more so in your hands than in the hands of someone else or some other entity that claims some kind of authority over you. So that Correct. I feel like that buyer beware or that, that, uh, self-awareness or that wariness, uh, that com comes big into play. And mm -hmm. especially that, I think that definitely translates in or, or applies to the property rights kind of thing, because it is true that that um, there's always, you know, with a state or without a state, there's always the fear of, of some mightier, more powerful force coming and oppressing you or taking whatever you thought was yours. Um, that's not, you know, uh, while, while statists like to say that that's a, uh, you know, a vulnerability of anarchism, I don't feel like that... That, that that vulnerability is unique to anarchism. Plenty of plenty of oppressive states got beaten up and and conquered by you know bigger equally mm -hmm. oppressive states. Um, mm -hmm. When it when it comes to property rights, though, uh, I I firmly believe that in an anarchist society, there's no reason why property could not be adequately defended uh, by the by those who use it or or own it, and that I feel like that would apply to a private property kind of situation as well as a public property kind of situation and I feel like um, even though I identify as an ANCAP and I and, and I definitely like to defend capitalism and free markets and private property rights I believe that in an anarchist society there would be room for all these different modes of, of property rights you know there would be room for worker owned co-ops and there would be room for private property including you know uh, uh, like landlords that own apartment complexes when they don't live in them you know that kind of thing there would be room for wage labor there would be room for working on things you don't own and owning things you don't work on just like there would be room for public property and communal property and and so on do you feel like there's room for 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 all these different kinds of property relations to exist in an anarchist society or do you feel like it's going to lean towards towards one or the other or exclude certain ones you know it's hard to tell but in theory i accept all possibilities because again there's no law prohibiting any of it it's just what do you agree with and then what can you get others to agree with too so like i believe there will be a variety of people as well but to exist in anarchy and like a real thing and not just a theory, humans are going to have to sort of transform themselves so much that it's really hard to tell what they're going to do and to impose our current version of human onto a real anarchy. It's almost like two different opposing ideas or like it's hard. It's just, who knows what <laughs> humans are. Maybe because because there would be such a difference, uh, such a change in the, in the way society is organized. 
I think mm-hmm. is what you're saying that it would be hard to hard to predict or hard to to foresee yeah. how the property rights would play out, huh? You yeah. can't determine what sort of human is really going to be there at that time to deal. Sure. Like, what are they going to? What's their perspective? Like for me, I'm generally cool with it. Like you know, personal property it tends to be less of an issue because it's smaller stuff like your toothbrush and you know your blanket and stuff like that. And generally, everybody's got one. But when it starts coming to shelter or food or water, and you know someone's just wandering by your house and they want to take an apple off your tree, and like for me, there's nothing to stop them except you. Mm-hmm. And so, just like animals, you would either have to do it on your own, practically constantly, or band together with other animals or humans to make your claim, um, I guess, more forceful, if you will. Because there's not going to be police there to protect your property for you while you go off to work or something like that, you know. So the there is a line like where I would draw, like to say, in modern or current society, uh, you know, say Nestle can go out there and buy a, California's water and then sell it back to California. I would draw a <laughs> line there. But, I love that no. example, by the way, the Nestle example. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, yes, and that's the way it is. It's like. I would accept aggression, violence on my part to stop that. Like one human, one amount. Like you don't get enough water for a thousand people, ten people, whatever. You get it for how many people you have. And not to say like, oh, I'm going to go out there and ration it. But if you have a lake and you have one person, I would be like, that's not your lake. You know, that's everybody's lake. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't believe in that form of private property where you can just kind of claim whatever you want and then expect people to honor it because you claimed it. Getting back, that's a good point, but I want to get back to the Nestle example that you used. Now, it's not the first time I've heard the the Nestle water selling uh, example before. And specifically, I've heard a lot of uh, of left-leaning people, both both pro-government and anti-government left-leaning people, use the Nestle argument, or the Nestle example rather, as some kind of argument against private property rights or an argument against profit or an, an argument against capitalism. Now, I see it a little bit differently though. When I see that Nestle water uh, scenario, I see it as a good criticism against public property, and I'll tell you why. The state of California uh, claims that you know the the waterways are publicly owned and owned in commons by the people, and then the state of California, the government specifically, uh, you know, gives itself the authority to uh, to negotiate or give away or or allow access to those public resources, you know, and and it could be a forest, it could be uh, a rock quarry, it could be water, it could be you know the the air we breathe, it could be anything. But the point is, is that they they uh, the government gives itself the authority to dispose of or 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 uh, you know distribute access to those public resources. And how did the government? distribute access to the public water in this case it gave it to nestle for for pennies on the dollar or for practically nothing and then it started buying it back from nestle right now so 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 the the real problem here i don't necessarily see as a as a as a, a company that wants to sell private water but i see the problem as being this uh monopolized government agency that that treats public property so uh so poorly or values it so incorrectly uh, it, it it reminds me of how, you know, like public farms produce fewer crops per acre than a private farm does or how, you know, the most polluted rivers are public publicly owned rivers and the cleanest rivers are privately owned or managed rivers, you know, or it also reminds me of how uh, publicly owned forests tend to have a lot more undergrowth and catch on fire more and tend to produce less, uh, uh, you know, useful lumber for society, whereas a privately managed forest is much more well maintained get catches on fire less and has a much higher amount of lumber output per acre for for use in in you know construction or business or whatever 
uh, I would have, I, I would say that if if we had more private property in the water in, in the water industry when it comes to water resources, that we would see fewer opportunities for for-profit companies to exploit it so severely and and basically rip off everyone, right? Um, you wouldn't be, you know, Nestle would have a lot more um, um, upkeep required on its hands to maintain and 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 be a good steward of a public water resource rather than just exploit it and take what it can from it while it says, oh, you know, the public the, the public water, that's your problem, California. We're just going to sell it for a profit. You know, uh, if, if, if it was a private water resource, they wouldn't get it for pennies on the dollar in the first place. They'd have to pay a much more fair, you know, value for it. Um, they would have to be much more careful in their stewardship of it and their main, maintaining of it as a viable resource and, and so on. So what, what I'm trying to get at, <laughs> there's a there's a there's a shorter way f to say that it, I, I went the long winded way, but the, the shorter phrase, and I'm sure you've heard this one before, is the tragedy of the commons, where a common resource is overexploited and under maintained by those that have access to it. Um, so I don't know. I, I want to hear your thoughts on that. OK, my <clears throat> my first sort of instinct is always to go to, like, what's the heart of the problem? And I think, um, you know, we have we use terms like public and private, and they're weighted in, to our current situation, so we define them in that way. However, to me, public and private, they are not inherently good or bad. They're just words. And so to me, in this case, what is wrong is the public trust is a good idea to have, you know, sort of, I guess, um, a water supply that can apply to everyone and not just a couple private individuals because everybody needs water. However, we don't have – we have taxation without representation currently. So, yes, it is a public resource, but it isn't run by people who represent us. So, therefore, it's kind of hard to even call it a public entity. Even though it's ours, so to speak, it's not under our control. So, hmm. I would say um, as much of a public property problem, it's a – public public problem like to say the real trust is the people trust like as opposed to the property trust it's the people trust that are being sort of exploited uh, neglected whatever um, let's see um, yeah uh, let me think here there's more to it but maybe I'll think about it in a moment um, <laughs> sure Sure. Um, you know what? And, well, I, I think I, I think I see what your objection is there and how how the, the public wasn't really properly represented and the government is basically just doing whatever it wants. It's yes. one thing for a government to say, oh, we represent the people, but it's another thing to, to, to actually hold the people's best interests in your actions. Right. Yeah. And what I wanted to also speak about the um, public lands and the management one, I believe you see it that way, at least in part. Some of it's true, like, you know, say the public lands and they weren't raked enough, you know, type stuff, and so the forest fires came out of control. One is public interest and private interest are different in that yeah. private, in our terms right here, is profit-driven. It's not just like an individual, hey, I need to use some water or a tree. It's like I'm going to cut the tree down and sell it for a profit as opposed to a house, build a house out of it. Public, like... It's there because it's there. Like, I'm not trying to make a profit over it. I want to enjoy the beauty. I want it to be pristine, you know, in its natural state. I don't care about its profitability. I care about its sustainability. And forest fires, for example, are natural. Um, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can get into that where, you know, certain conditions create fires more and other than that. And so the public property is, I guess wasted, so to speak, but nature doesn't look at it like that. And also the natives, um, you know, Aborigines and Native Americans and things like this, they were land managers. And so they created a, a public space for their animals, or like to say the deer and their game animals, so that it was mm -hmm. a like a crop rotation except with animal habitat. And so they would manage the land in this way in a public way. It wasn't just an individual's hunting grounds. It was the tribe's hunting grounds, and they all shared in it, and it was public land, but it was managed in the way that you would describe the private way because it became more mm. profitable. You know, it was profitable to the community through their management, and that's one of the biggest, I guess, differences between animals and humans for me is 
there's the law of the jungle and the law of the garden. And the law of the jungle, kill or be killed, and it's sort of like the basic anarchy. And then there's the law of the garden where it's still no law on what you got to do, but you choose to put it into order anyway, you know. And so you impose a sort of efficiency and a productivity on um, a garden that maybe a jungle just doesn't have. And that's hmm. the way I look at that. Interesting. And you know what? I actually liked your point about how when, uh, the, you know, the Native Americans were using – a land that was essentially like everyone had the animals had public access to it but instead of it being mismanaged it was relatively well managed and mm -hmm. um forgive me if i'm misusing this word but it seems to me like in a sense they were profiting from that that management of that land in the sense that everyone was prospering and getting resources from it and it was sustainable rather than something that was just being slashed and burned or something that was polluted or something that was depleted and became you know there was a shortage of it that was not the case they were they, they 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 were good stewards of that public resource but you know then again and i think about that it's like how come they could manage a public resource so much better than say, you know, the, the, the state of California, you know, Sacramento, the capital or whatever. And I realized it's because the people themselves were managing it. You know, you've got your different tribes and families and communities all directly involved in the management of this public resource rather than um, uh, the offloading that responsibility to this ivory tower intellectual who has an army of thugs that, you know, make yeah. these make these backroom deals with Nestle or whoever it is, right? So it's like when you have a government, right, you're removing that direct connection between the people and the public resource. And then all of a sudden you're wondering, well, gee, it seems almost as if the government's like j just doing whatever it wants with this, uh, with, with this resource for the government's interest rather than for the interest of the people, right? Almost like as if it's using the, the, the what's supposed to be a public resource in a private fashion, but then in a non-sustainable fashion and it just becomes this big mess, right? Right. The difference is public profit versus private profit. Like California should benefit profit from California's water, not Nestle, you know, and if Nestle's going to be involved, they should do it for the profit of California, not Nestle. That's the way I see it. Um, so mm -hmm. that one of the problems I have with capitalism is they focus too much on the individual. Yes, it's the basis, but it is not the whole picture, you know. A community is a bunch of individuals, and it's when you sort of separate and break that chain of sustainability for profitability, then you lose that aspect that keeps it there. Like court, uh, capitalists tend to be uh, interested in short-term profits. They don't care about the long-term. You know, Carl, Carl Rove talking about the um, uh, global warming or the climate change and oil and stuff like that. He's like, who cares? In 80 years, we won't be here. And that's <laughs> their mentality. Typical you know? Carl. Like, they care. They're going to milk it for all that they can and then die. And that's the way they look at it. They don't think, well, my kids and grandkids and great-grandkids and great-grandkids need it. Then so we have to maintain it. They're just like, milk it dry, bleed it dry. It's dead. It's a husk. But who cares? So are we. You know? That's the difference. Because those tribes, they were thinking sustainable. They Like, they lasted 10,000 years for a reason. We're struggling to last four or 500 years for a reason. And it's because of that short-term perspective and that individual profit, like, Profit I'd call natural. You know, I describe it as, say, you plant a tomato seed, and that tomato seed grows up into a tomato plant that produces a number of tomatoes with thousands more seeds. That, to me, is profit. You know, you invested. There was a risk because there's no guarantee, but and generally it pays off, and there's more in the end. And that is nature's version of sustainable profit. Hmm. You know, it feeds within itself. It does not extract it. Like, it doesn't withdraw those tomatoes and expect you to go find tomatoes somewhere else to start over again and then hoard those tomatoes and, you know, constantly um, extract and extract and extract. It's like, no, you put in, you take out, you put in, you take out, you know, it's n n a zero sum game. Hmm. I like that tomato plant analogy. Um, but what, 
it's funny because uh, I, I'll be the first to admit, even though I'm a lover of, of all things capitalism, I'll absolutely admit that plenty of private entities and for-profit entities can have a short-term focus and can, um, you know, not see the forest for the trees. They can focus on, you know, just getting a quick buck and then destroying some resource. It, it happens. But I would say that 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 it doesn't happen as often as the other way around where the for-profit private entity does have a long-term focus. It can go either way. Now, but let me give you an example and I want to touch on uh, I want to touch on gardens and crops. So okay. the 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 highest output yielding farmlands in the world are privately owned. Most of them exist in America, and I think some in Canada as well. And then I think there's a few in Europe. And it depends, it, you know, it depends on which crop. But the vast majority of 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 uh, of, of ho the highest performing outputting yielding farms are for profit and they're or and they're privately owned and uh, on the other hand when you look at a um a publicly owned farm uh or a communally owned uh farmland the output level of the crops is very low and they suffer from a very high amount of corruption whereas um they're more susceptible to thievery theft of the crops both from outside parties and from within from from you know like an inside job sometimes the workers on these communal lands will steal and of course you know workers will steal from any company but it's more of a problem in the communal and publicly owned farms. And I'm talking about places like Cuba and Venezuela, um, China and Vietnam back in the 70s, although China and Vietnam have privatized their farms for the most part since then. This was a very big problem for them back in the 70s uh, and, and, and before then when they were doing their, their communist revolution stuff. Let me give you a really good example because I was re reading about this very recently. You know, uh, when America invaded Vietnam, and first off, I, I'm, I totally oppose the American invasion of Vietnam, and I'm glad that Viet the Vietnamese kicked America out. But what happened was, you know, th they kicked America out, and then they said, okay, finally we can do communism, and they collectivized all the farms, and they quickly suffered a really big food shortage. And the Vietnamese populace was not happy with that. So by the like mid 80s, a lot of grumbling started happening and a lot of resistance started building against the communal farms because the output was terrible. And they started reprivatizing the farms bit by bit. Now you fast forward to today, the communal farm uh, uh, and public farm uh, model is pretty much abandoned in Vietnam now. now. Now the vast majority of the farmland in Vietnam is privately owned or managed. They no longer have to sell their, their they're no longer required to sell crops to the government at a specific price and, and meet a quota and all that. They can just sell on the open market or do whatever they want with their crops. And now, thanks to those reforms, the, Vietnam, the, the country of Vietnam is the largest exporter of rice in the world. They grow enough food now to not only feed themselves but feed a whole bunch of other countries and they're famous for their high quality rice and and and, and they output just a whole bunch of it it's it, it's a real success story now uh i'm not gonna say that there's absolutely zero place for public property rights um or for communal for communal property and 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 and, and a shared you know uh, stewardship of given resources but what i think is that the 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 private model and the for-profit model you know that bounty that that explosion in output coincided with vietnam with the vietnamese reforms allowing more profit seeking by these farmers they said where can i get the bit the best bang for my buck when i trade this rice that I've produced. And the more profit they made, the more money they were able to reinvest into their farms and into their technology and equipment and increase their output further. And now they all have well-fed bellies and they're feeding the bellies of a whole bunch of other people out there. So so what what I think is that if we, if we were to get rid of the state and transition into an anarchist society, I feel like there would definitely be room for and there would be a lot of positive feedback for those who exercised some form of private property rights and some form of profit. We wouldn't have to see like a Nestle nightmare scenario like you described, although it, it, it's it, it's totally possible that it could happen. I think it would be the exception rather than the rule. And I think we would see more uh, of, a, of a positive growth and positive uh, uh, pr increase in prosperity like we see just using that Vietnam, Vietnam, you know, farm reform example. What do you think? <clears throat> when I hear communism, I tend to think it's state capitalism because... <laughs> Especially in a state, it's like, 
sure, these farmers get together and want to do their own thing, but then the state steps in and puts quotas where they put mm -hmm. uh, speeds got to grow or they got um, certain markets you got to take it to, stuff like that, as opposed to it's my community, let us figure it out. You know, we don't need your input. And if I'm cool or we're cool uh, just producing enough for us and ourselves and maybe our neighbors, then who cares? You know, like profit is not my main motive. Survivability, living is. And so that's why I call it state capitalism and not communism because there's no, like, need for a profit motive. There's, there's always going to be more produced, generally speaking, with nature. Like, you put in a little bit, you're going to get more out. But to produce so much that you then sell it, consider what else those resources could be used for in that community. Like you are diverting community resources around the world and outside of the community, and you're getting money for it. Like you're not getting something, I would say, progressive, if you will. Like you're not getting a better health care or you're not getting more free time or, you know, healthier food. Because one of the things about agriculture – uh, nutrition went down. Uh, you know, we didn't gain health; we gained wealth. And agriculture brought on, you know, plagues and all the dregs and ills of uh, civilization. And um, you know, hard work that didn't used to be like that. Like women had started spending their whole day grinding grain, and that's literal backbreaking work. And it's not like, mm -hmm. okay, let's pick some berries and have some fun with the kids. You know, that's – like you cannot put a price on happiness and fulfillment and joy in life. And to say my sole existence is to produce more and more and more and more, it's like mm -mm, you are going to drain yourself, and I don't support that idea. Like you, there has to be a certain, I guess, happy medium where you say, okay, beyond this point, it's too much. Are you are you kind of like opposed to are you opposed to the 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 search for profit in principle or are you more or are you trying to say more like 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 profit only gets you so far and there has to be more to it than that I mean are are you saying profit should be just uh, searched for in moderation or do you think that that like a non profit kind of model is, is the way to go? I mean, like, like I'm, I'm trying to ask how deep is your condemnation of profit here? Um, in general, again, um, I assume profit is already part of it. Like, I don't have to factor it into my business plan to make it happen. Like, if I mm -hmm. do it right, it happen no matter what. And if it turns out that um, my needs are met and I have enough left over, like, you know, with money-wise, my bills are paid, I have some savings, I have some fun money, I don't need more than that. Like that beyond that, it would just be greed on my part, knowing my heart. Like I know I don't need more than that. And mm -hmm. so if I have to start dedicating more and more of my time to create more and more money or profit that I don't need, I want, then I spend my time going to a goal and never reaching the goal. So, you know, planting a garden the end harvest is the goal. It's and then to get through the winter or whatever like that, you know, but it's not to say, man, I need to work twice as hard so I can sell it to somebody else and then, you know, buy some stuff. Like that to me is not my motive. Uh, <laughs> I'm much more of a lover of free time and, you know, leisure and going out and enjoying life. And I believe that is a lost art in this world right now that People forget what it's like to enjoy yourselves because of the profit. Like they're just like more, 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 and that's not natural. That's what uh, cancer is. And hmm. no, no, thank you. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. It, it sounds like a. So it sounds like you're you're more interested in seeing people appreciate a, a work life balance, and um, you're looking at quality of life. Uh, on a larger scope than just material acquisition or profit acquisition. And it's about the, the, the quality of the time that you get to spend because you only got yes. 24 hours in the day. But yep. 
but but it doesn't sound like you're necessarily uh, flat out uh, opposed to profit in principle. The, the, it's just that you you don't think it's the be all end all. It's, there's more to it than that, and sure. and that society has to recognize there's more to it than that. So, so right. uh, well that's refreshing because <laughs> that's a lot better than like you know some communists will say, man, profit is is, is always theft, and I'm like, oh come on, you know. <laughs> See, uh, part part of that is because I mean capitalism, if you will. Everyone has been trained to look at things in terms of money. What is its monetary value? What is its worth to me as opposed to what is its worth? What is its real value? And it's not based on me. And as much as humans like to think they're sort of separate from everything else, they're not. They still follow the same natural order and the same laws, the natural laws, the same sort of, um, I guess, mental and emotional interactions and reactions and things like this that – to constantly focus on what something's monetary value or worth it is to me separates it from everything else, and that's not natural. Again, that yeah. that's you get that sort of hoarded wealth. And again, in nature, when you hoard things, they rot, they go stagnant, and that is uh. that's so stagnant. It's why it's rotting. It's because it's not circulating, and that is the natural order. Keep it flowing. Get that flow go, and if it starts to stop up, then there's it's getting clogged somewhere. Someone's stopping it up, and you gotta keep, get that flow going again. Hmm. I like that description. You know what though? I want to uh, I want to first ag- agree with you and give you my own little anecdote, and then I'm gonna follow up by disagreeing with you uh, to a to a certain degree. So check it out. I uh, sometimes I have to go work on weekends. Normally I work Monday through Friday like typical schedule, but sometimes uh, sometimes my workload gets a little bit heavier and I want to try and catch up to it. So I'll go to work uh, on occasion during the weekends and sometimes I have 7-day work weeks, right? And although I feel productive at the job when I go put in the extra time, uh, my my kids will say that they miss me or the wife says that she misses me and I'll feel like I've been missing out on on free time or quality time with my friends and family. So I, I, I definitely uh, see what you mean when you talk about how how there needs to be more than just seeking material accumulation or or, or, or measuring everything in money. And, um, I, I agree that it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's not the numbers in your life. It's the amount of, you know, life in your years or, or, or yeah. I, I don't know if I screwed up well, that f- figure speech. <laughs> yeah. But <clears throat> let me tell you something else <laughs> now to contradict what I just said and to kind of give you a, a, a disagreement point to go on here. I was reading recently, they were talking about the history of work, you know, throughout like most of human history, right? Since, you know, the, since the medieval times. And seven day work weeks working 12 to 14 hours a day used to be the norm. And especially for the men, um, you would you would work constantly and then, you know, come home at night and the kids would already be asleep. And then you'd wake up before dawn and have to go work because there wasn't as much technology that everyone was dirt poor back then, you know, hundreds of years ago. Right. Before the technological revolution. But today, today now. Uh, they, based on the studies they've done, they've noted that humans uh, have more free time to spend with their families uh, than they used to. And they were, they were looking at men specifically because women, women at least traditionally would be in the house while the men go out and work. And they said that men um, nowadays, at least in the first world countries, uh, have more hours available to spend with their children and that their children, you know, the, the, the kids get to um, be around their fathers more than they used to be a couple hundred years ago. And mm-hmm. that that's and, and then the, the study went on to talk about how that's a benefit for the development of the children. And it's also a benefit for the mental well-being of the of, of the, the man as well as the woman and and all that stuff, you know, and it went into a bunch of detail. But basically, the 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 idea was that as our uh, prosperity keeps on going up, as our technology keeps on increasing and as the free markets and private property rights keep spreading around and and expanding it's produced um you know a a, a better work-life balance is what i'm getting at now of course there's always going to be some people that are freaking workaholics right and sometimes i can be guilty of of that i guess on an occasional weekend but 
it does seem to me from what I've been reading is that uh, I like to think that, that the more the more capitalism, the more profits, the more uh, wealth that we generate, the more free time we find ourselves being able to take advantage of if we choose. You know, like like in 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 Venezuela, they have to wait in line twelve hours to get a you know a couple gallons of gasoline or to get uh you know the, uh, a bag of flour, but in a private food industry, you can go get your uh, flour at the grocery store and you wait in line for five minutes, or you go to the gas station and you fill up and you're only waiting as long as it takes for the gas to pour into your gas tank. You don't have to wait for for you know hours and hours on end for these kind of things. So uh, I'd like to see, I I I well I'd like to see. Let me let me back up. I think that the uh, the path to a greater quality of life and leisure time and and having fun and doing more than just the profit seeking stuff is to embrace those systems that uh, provide the most efficient allocation of resources. And that's going to be the, usually it's going to be a private property free market type of framework. Um, although there can be, there can be a place for the more socialistic or socialized aspects of, uh, of industry. I, th my prediction would be that in an anarchist society, we would see the private property for profit model become much more popular or more dominant in the economic sector. That, that 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 would be my prediction, you know. Okay. So there's a lot to respond there, and I'll start at the beginning with your extra work. Yeah, sorry and, about uh, that long-winded thing. No problem. I enjoy it. So um, sometimes extra work is required. Say your normal wages don't cover a car problem or a vacation. So you're like, I'm going to put in a little extra time to have that future, a larger perspective gain, as opposed to that short-term. Like you're not just working to – get extra money, you're working to pay for a car or a vacation, like you have a goal. And so, yes, that's something kids will have to learn as they grow up. Like there's responsibilities, there's plans, there's bigger pictures than just right here, right now. And that's part of growing up. Like you just got to learn that, you know, no, no reason to feel bad depending mm -hmm. on your motives. It's like this, you know, you just got to do what you got to do sometimes or even what you want to do, and that's fine. Um, as opposed to the part where you disagree, um, Let's see here. Remind me again. I got lost in my train of thought with that. Sure. So, uh, yeah, because I, I was long-winded. I, I first, you know, tried to agree with you by telling you about my little overwork story about mm -hmm. the weekends. But then I went on to say okay. that there were studies I, shown that in the old days, men saw their kids and wives a lot less because they had to work a lot longer hours. And nowadays, especially and, and in the countries that have the most prosperity, men have more free time today mm -hmm. to spend That's with their absolutely. children and their family benefits with increased presence of their father in the house because they don't have to work quite as much as they used to have to. All right. So yes, say um, a man worked 14 hours a day in the fields or whatever. Now the man works eight hours a day at a factory, but his wife also works eight hours a day at a grocery store. Ah. So not only is the, the dad home more, the mom is home less. So ah. it's a trade-off, and if you really want to know, it's that sort of capitalist, I guess, you know, two breadwinners, like one, most people can't afford to have just one breadwinner anymore, that this whole money system is what's breaking up this nuclear family, as they like to call it. Like, that's what's tearing people apart, as, you know, not being home together, not having dinner together, not knowing each other's lives, and so... School has become a babysitter, and dad and mom are too tired to. Yeah, they're there, but are they? What's the quality of time as opposed to the quantity mm. of time? Like, are you helping to raise your kids, or are you sitting in front of the TV and just like too exhausted to do anything else? And so it's it's not just terms, but definitions as well. So yes, home more, but what's the quality? Are you uh, actually benefiting your kids by being there? Um, so I look at it like that, and that whole system of, say, conservatism, if you will, that um, uh, like the greatest generation, the one that won mm -hmm. the world work and stuff, that whole work ethic of the 50s and whatnot, it created the hippies. Like the hippies are the children. <laughs> of that. So it created its own downfall because they had time to recognize this is not what I want. This is not right. Like you should not – 
hate your kid for being your kid. You should not force yourself onto your kid. Like I follow my father's footsteps type thing. Like that whole break from tradition is a result of tradition. Huh. And people like, they don't recognize that. Like they keep wanting to go back to that 1950s conservatism, like make America great again. But America was not great and Americans knew it. And so they broke from that and it's a struggle. And I believe anarchy as well will take two or three generations. Like just like Israel in the wilderness, you know, you're wondering, but that old generation had to die off before the new generation could have the right mind to inherit the promised land. Like that old mind frame, that conservatism, of following your father's footsteps, don't question authority, do what you're told, it is what it is, it always has been, it, that is not going to push us forward. It's going to get us stuck in the past. Hmm. And so, uh, yeah, everything's a trade-off. Um, and working as a family, like, um, you know, at least in the fields, you worked with your kids sometimes. And the mom worked with the daughters, the dad worked with the sons. But nowadays it's like, how much do you really know about your family? Hmm. Man, I liked your uh, uh, I liked your hippie uh, reference too because it's funny, man. I, even though I'm sitting here going, "Oh yeah, you know, more private property, more money, more profits," um, I I totally identify with the counterculture movement. I'm a big fan <laughs> of uh, uh, of the music and the culture that the That's hippie or counterculture generation created. It was right before, because I, I was born in the 70s, but I know people that are older than me that really experienced that whole thing firsthand, and they've told me some amazing stories about you know the whole the, the whole mindset and um, the revolution that basically happened, the cultural revolution that happened in. <laughs> in North America back then. So it, it it's pretty fascinating, but, um, mm -hmm. man, uh, it's like going from black and white to color. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like that movie, what Pleasantville or something yeah. where everyone changes from the conservative to the, uh, to the modern like hippie or, or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it, 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 it's geez. How can I tie the hippie thing into uh, a pro-capitalism argument? I don't know if I can. <laughs> I would say capitalism to me represents personal responsibility. You know, like mm -hmm. to say, I take care of myself. Um, hippies, like, one reason the hippie movement failed is because they didn't know how to take care of themselves. They were, They grew up being taken care of. And, mm -hmm. you know, that work ethic was not shared. And when it was, they became the yuppies, and we got Reaganomics and that whole trickle-down and supply side. And yeah. That, like, that's not that's the opposite of what real work ethic is. And I think that is like they tried to go backwards and, you know, recapture their parents. Like, oh, well, I guess I need to keep my trust fund or my mom and dad want me to do this, so I might as well. It's time to get off the drugs and get off the commune and go back to the real world. But yeah. in reality, the real world was not what it, they thought it was. Like, it's it wasn't 1950s anymore. It was 1980s. And yeah. so they had to yeah. adapt. You know, they just – they fell short. You know, it, it, and to tie into that, um, I, I agree with that story because I remember reading something a while back where they said, you know, look, it, the hippies – in the 60s and early 70s, they were taking acid tabs and going to musical concerts. And then by the 80s, they had all put on suits and ties and become patent attorneys, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably the source. Like these baby boomers are like, well, you start out as a progressive and then you become a conservative. However, Winston Churchill or whoever said it, like if you start out as, I don't know, a progressive and then if, by the time you get to 40, you're a conservative or something like this. It's because they grew up into their parents after all. You know, they mm -hmm. started to see that whole profits over people or money or like I need to be secure mm -hmm. first as opposed to free first. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like Benjamin Franklin said something like, uh, you know, people who give up liberty for security deserve neither. And that's what they did. Yeah. And if you look at the world around us, we are less secure because of it. Hmm. 
you know, you've got uh, you, you've got some interesting analyses and criticisms on uh, for 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 both you know left and right kind of kind of leanings, and mm-hmm. you've got a lot of nuance, and I and I like those things because it seems to me like you're 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 less interested in just like blind ideological faith, and you're more interested in analyzing, okay, where's the strengths and weaknesses of, of, you know, this idea or that idea. You've got good and you've got, you've got good and bad things to say about capitalism. You've got good and bad things to say about socialism. I know you said, I know you said at the beginning of our, of our conversation that you might lean a little more left in general, but it seems to me like you're more of an anarchist without adjectives. Would you say that's fair? Yes, that is my attempt because balance is always one of my first things to achieve because in the end, like, even if you're off to the left or to the right just a smidge, it will throw you off in the end because it just a little adds up, a little adds up, a little adds up. And so, yes, you know, there are aspects from one side that work, aspects from the other side that work, but it's not like I have to adhere to the entire I- ideology to take – the good ideas, so to speak, like it's not a religion to me, and I am not. I don't know. I, I just don't feel like I owe it anything. You know, I don't mm. have to, like support or defend somebody else's ideas. You know, and say Adam Smith and John Locke, they had good ideas. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's right 100% of the time, and I don't have to pretend they are because someone else disagrees with me and somehow that reflects on me. No, it doesn't. Like, it's not my idea, and I have to defend it if it's not right. Like, that doubling down on something wrong, that's the real mistake. Everybody makes mistakes, admit it, move on, learn, and we can, you know, progress. Like, progress is not a bad word. It doesn't mean, you know, craziness or, you know, government control of every aspect of society. It means moving forward. And that's just the natural order. You move forward. That's what evolution does, natural selection. You just move forward. And not moving forward is not natural. And that's where you get stuck in the past. And so Hmm. I'm always looking, like, what's the honest assessment so that I can truly learn? Like, I don't want to just think I'm right or other people to think I'm right. I want to be right. I want to be correct. And I want to be true. You know, that's what I care about. No allegiance to anything else. Hmm. Interesting. I like it, man. It, it seems really pure to me, you know? Um, um, it seems like, uh, what is it like that? Like this, I want to say the scientific method or you, you, you know yes. what I mean? Like th- that, that exactly. way you that like you make your observations, you make a yeah. hypothesis and then you start over. Cool. Cool. So, it, and it, it's interesting here because what I see what, when I think about what you said, and I'm thinking about anarchists. I spend a lot of I spend a lot of time talking and and arguing with people who who consider themselves anarcho communists, and then I spend a lot of time circle jerking with people who consider themselves anarcho capitalists. <laughs> However, I am a big fan of the bottom unity thing. I think I told you this in text chat previously. What I see is like is like when 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 someone who labels themselves an anarcho-communist says, oh, you know, we have to forcibly prohibit profit, then I'm like, well, that's not an anarchist thing. That's like a tanky move. That's an authoritarian move. You're you're more of a statist, maybe a state capitalist. But then, on the other hand, I have talked to anarcho-communists who have, who have said, look, there's, there's no way an anarchist society could stop uh, someone from privately owning something, you know, if, if, they, if they get other people to go along with it. So although maybe, you know, and the ANCOM will say, look, maybe I don't, I don't like capitalism or I don't like private property, but I recognize that you can't just like forcibly stop it in an anarchist society. You would have to persuade people and you would have to rely on, you know, on, 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 on people making their own decisions. And then that kind of thing, when I hear that coming from an ANCOM, I get really positively impressed and I go, wow, that sounds really real. And that, that sounds way more anarchist and way less tanky than that other guy was a moment ago. And then what happens is when I think about what they just said, it makes me feel like that bottom unity thing is really happening. Like, like there's like almost like a collapse in the, in the dichotomy between the left and right, the further anarchist you go, that, that dichotomy collapses and becomes almost like a singularity, like, like the political compass, instead of the political compass being a square, 
it's a diamond. And the left and right, when you get further down into the anarchy, boom, all of a sudden you're a socialist and a capitalist at the same time. I don't know. That's what it seems like to me, man. It's, uh, you know, it seems like there's room for both there. That's why I kept saying, oh, you know, there's room for both kinds of property in an anarchist society. It's, it, I don't know. It's, it's the bottom unity thing I'm getting at. Yeah. I agree because <clears throat> for me, anarchy is about removing labels because labels tend to be other people's definition of me. Rarely, you know, I don't use a lot of labels for myself. I have a few, yeah. but generally speaking, if I have a label for myself, it's because someone else came up with it. Like, I'm a white guy. Like, I don't define myself that way. That's just what other people would classify me as, a man yeah. or an American or a, a communist or whatever. For me, you take all those labels away. You boil us all down. We all become the same thing. We're all just people. We're all just earthlings. Like, there is no other label that can really – apply to everyone so if unity is the goal find the one thing that brings us all together and so for me it's like earthling or human or something like that and then there's no division we're like people like to say democracy is majority rule it's not it's people rule and i say majority versus minority only exists when we the people become divided because democracy is just people rule that's what it means you know you may not think that or believe that but that's what the word means and people tend to have a problem with majority rule when they're minority but when they're majority they don't have a problem with it you know? <laughs> so it's like oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> because everybody thinks they knows they know what's best for everybody else and you know in a way their heart may be in the right place you know like a commie may be like yeah we're going to impose health care on everybody or we're going to impose profit limits on everybody because they think that's what's right that's what's best because they see the problems and they think okay here's a solution but that's just more of the same problem because you're never giving people a chance to learn their lessons and make the right choice for themselves or even make mistakes on their own and recognize it's a mistake they're always like reactionary like oh Tanky Kami says it's a mistake. It must be right. So I'm going to double down on it as opposed to like, well, maybe they have a point. Maybe there's a certain point profit is excessive. Or maybe people do need health care more than I need my liberty idea. You know, something like this because life is more important than liberty to me. And so priorities would say health care over profits, over philosophy. Like that's all in your head, you know. It, you can't hmm. prove it. It's just all in your head. It's what you want to believe when people are out there dying for real, you know, no matter what they believe. Commies, cappies, atheists, it doesn't matter. People are dying because they don't have access to health care. And that's more important to me than, say, a philosophy that I have to adhere to, you know. So I just go by hmm. what priorities. Yeah. But I, as opposed to, like, to say I would prefer people choose it, you know, like to say – recognize it and because uh, I'm not going to force it on you. I'd rather go without than force it on people. But at the same time, I understand the sort of intent. Like people want to um, ban abortion. Like in their minds, they're doing the right thing. But you're still imposing your will on other people. And that's the opposite of you know, And I don't support that sort of thing. I like it. Uh, it, it it sounds like a like a voluntarist kind of thing, you know, where you're where just a moment ago you mentioned uh, something about, you know, getting people have to have to agree or do it of their own free will uh, to 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 find these connections and cooperate with each other. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like that a lot more than the whole than the whole. Um, authoritarian blanket a priori we're going to prohibit this kind of activity or we're going to prohibit that kind of activity you know so mm -hmm. it's uh, it's um it feels more uh persuasive to me when an uh, when an idea talks about how it needs to have a uh a human consent or you know you have to persuade rather than dictate where you have to convince rather than compel so I, I i definitely like that idea yes and it really it i don't even judge it as right or wrong because i look at it in terms of child and adult and you impose your will on your children and you don't think anything of it that's like that's what you do to children is you discipline them you guide them, you direct them, you boss them around, you make them do things for their own benefit or because they don't know what they're doing or they don't understand. 
and that's seen as acceptable. Like that form of authoritarianism is understood as acceptable. Like if you didn't discipline your kids, you'd probably have worse problems. It's just that we're people, like through religion and statism, are so conditioned to be constant children that they never grow up. Like they never learn to take personal responsibility. They never learn to understand that the more responsible you are, the more you take into account. So it's not just me I'm worried about, but everyone. You know, I, I don't just have to worry about my stuff, but everybody else's stuff as well, and sort of making sure everyone has enough and not just myself, just like I would a family. Like I have to look out for, you know, the kids who can't go out there and do it themselves or they have skills that I don't have that they do or, you know, we all work together to complement each other as opposed to control each other. And religion is the same way where they keep people children so they can keep them afraid and in, under control. And state is the same way. Wow. I love the tie-in with statism and, and, and organized religion, keeping people under control, infantile, and infantilizing them, treating them like, like, like more like a property or a ward rather than, in, than, than a, than a, than an equal, you know, uh, counterpart, man. Um, mm -hmm. but you know what? I cannot believe it. It's already been an hour. It feels like it's been 20 minutes, you know, <laughs> time flies when you're having good conversation. Um, so, but what, what I'm going to have to do now is we'll, is we'll wrap it up and we'll say goodbye to the audience. Um, maybe we can schedule another, uh, another discussion sometime in the near future. Sure. I, I had a lot of fun and I hope you had fun too. Absolutely. Like you're a mature man. I appreciate that. Like you didn't get into your cappy ruts and be like, no, like you have to believe in property. And yeah. you didn't try and challenge me on stereotypical BS that you're like, oh, you must love Stalin type stuff. So <laughs> yes, you know, mutual respect was definitely good. Thank you. Yeah, and my I, pleasure, man. I want to be yeah, a better man. class of capitalist. <laughs> Oh, good work. You're on your way. Yeah. Well, man, you gave me some really fun food for thought. Um, I think I, I, I think we both uh, did a good job of, of presenting our ideas about uh, property rights and about the nature of the state and uh, a free society. Um, to everyone watching and listening, you know, let us know what you think about it in the comments. And um, so I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks again, everybody. And we'll have more videos uploaded soon.